Welcome to George Mason University and Studio A. My name is Rick Davis, and our guest today is filmmaker Sarah Stein. Dr. Stein has won several Academy Awards for Best Documentary Short, Best Live Action Short, and several Emmys for Outstanding Documentary Special, Best News Documentary, and Best Documentary Short. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Stein. Thank you. We have one important business item before we proceed, and that is, may I call you Sarah? Yes, please do. All right, Thank very you. good. Uh, <laughs> tell us when and how you first got into filmmaking. Um, it was completely accidental, um, the way some things are sometimes in life. I mean, I was pre-med, and uh, <laughs> uh, I was at Barnard College in uh, New York City in Columbia, and um, came up against chemistry. Now, I don't want to say that in any way to discourage anybody from doing this if that's their predilection, but chemistry and I did really didn't do too well together. So I took a year's leave of absence, which was to be just a year, and had to make a living. And a friend had an opening for a receptionist in a company, and it happened to be a film company. Um, you know, I've often said to my students when I teach film that, you know, if they'd made lawnmowers, then I could be a lawnmower person at this point. I had no thought of film at all. I hadn't taken any film classes. I love movies, but who didn't? I never thought of myself as creative. Uh, creative people were the people who painted and who wrote poetry, etc. and that wasn't anything I did. And um, I came into that job and fell in love with this whole world. What a remarkable point of entry into, yeah. a, into a magnificent career. Yeah. Uh, tell us about some of your powerful memories from that, those first several film experiences, or maybe your first film project. Probably the one, that's, um, the one that really stands out uh, for me as the first film was the film Bolero. Mm -hmm. That came several years after I had begun, though. Um, my career began as a receptionist. I didn't know how to type. And even though I'm an <laughs> academic now, I still don't know how to type. <laughs> I don't think that's a recommendation. But <laughs> what it meant was that I kept going from receptionist to receptionist job. And I, um, after a year and a half of going from reception to reception job and understanding that in the film business, you have to have something that you know how to do. You have to have a skill. You have to have some craft and art form. And I happened to get a job as a receptionist um, with a film editor. And he wanted to train somebody as an apprentice, and that's how I got started. And then I spent two years as an assistant. And you really work yourself through the film business. It's really a guild business in that way. And film schools were very rare at the time. So the first film that was really a big deal for me was when I had gone out on my own. I knew that I wanted to do documentary film editing. And the film Bolero came about. Um, public television had put out a bid for people to submit proposals for a film that taught music, in a sense, and what was an orchestra about, but being something that was really entertaining as well. And um, the, ed the uh, director asked me to do it because I had met him as an assistant. But he really asked me to do it because I would work for $250 a week. Oh, yes. <laughs> we, we worked. 14 hours a day, six days a week for six weeks straight. It was a brutal um, schedule, but the, the film was fantastic. It was shot with three cameras. As soon as I saw, I saw the dailies, I said, I don't care what you pay me. If I can pay my rent, which at the time was $65 because I was living in a fifth floor walk-up with a bathtub in the kitchen, actually, <laughs> in Manhattan. <laughs> so I could afford to do this. And you know, sometimes you see something and you know, this is beautiful. I must be involved with it. So I said, yes, I do want to cut that. I don't care what, it, what you can pay me. Just keep me alive. So that's how that came about. And at the time, cutting a film literally meant cutting a film, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, we worked on um, one of the first um, three head flat um, editing tables. It was actually not a Steenbeck at that time. It was called a Keller, and then it became a Cam. And it had three um, picture heads and three sound heads. And the way Bolero was shot was shot with three cameras. But Zubin Mehta and the LA Philharmonic had recorded um, on Decca Records just before the shooting the whole Ravel's Bolero. So the, the um, musicians played their parts in in our filming, but I used the master soundtrack from the recording itself. So they were lip syncing in effect. So they were lip syncing yeah. in effect, and what I had to do was, and at that time it wasn't digital, so I had to actually physically sync up the, the lip sync 
um, recording of each musician to the master track. But the master track quality, of course, was fabulous, and we could never have had that with documentary filmmaking. I mean, we'll, you know, we just never have gotten that. Well, and that was a pretty good way to, to uh, make your mark in the profession because you won a, a pretty major award for that film. If yes, I'm not that mistaken. won the. Um, the Live Action Academy Award. Oh, the Academy Award, yes. Yeah. That's what we call a major award. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes absolutely. Well, it just so happens that we have some, uh, some film from Great. Bolero here yeah. that, that we'd like to show. And good. what we've chosen is the first minute yeah. and the last minute. Oh, those and, are good. and just yeah. to just to prepare our, our audience for this, the first minute of this film is uh, the musicians setting up their stands and just getting ready for what looks like a regular old rehearsal. Backstage, right. And then in the stuff we won't see, you'll see Zubin Mehta, or Zubin Mehta the conductor, talks and prepares the orchestra and so on. Then there's a rehearsal. And we are going to see the last minute where the, this beautiful music is reaching its climax. Actually, that was actually the concert part. The rehearsal is in the first yeah. half, right? And right. The so concert, it's, it's you're going to see the last minute of the actual concert. And this yeah. is that famous piece of music which you'll recognize as soon as you hear it from, right. from the film Ten and many right. other concert right. performances. So if we if we right. could roll our yeah. film of Bolero, good. Let's see some good editing. <laughs> Cheers. That is just a tour de force of the editor's uh, art, I think. Uh, why did you decide to focus on editing uh, earlier in your career? That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, there's a certain temperament to each job in the film business. I mean, the film, the film business is really very, very compartmentalized. I think when students make films, they do every job. But in the business itself, you do one job, partly because it takes years until you're really good enough. You know, there's so much money at stake and so much at stake that way. Um, I cut film for 25 years and I'd say around the 15th year I was really just solid, you know, but it took that long and cinematographers will say the same thing. Um, documentary appealed to me because I always had a sort of social activist interest. I was very much a child of the 60s and um, I wanted to do something that had to do with people's lives and impact. And um, there was also a practical reason. I wanted to stay in New York. I didn't want to go to L.A. I was a New Yorker. And um, the documentary film uh, locus was really New York, and L.A. is features. And um, that was the business I wanted to be in, so I stayed in New York. Did you ever do any work in the, in the narrative film? A line? little bit, mm -hmm. yes. Actually, um, the students will probably be amused to know that I worked on the first... Um, film that Arnold Schwarzenegger made, <laughs> Hercules in New York. <laughs> he had a picture of Arnold in a, uh, 
in a little short white skirt That's in Central Park. Strangely easy to picture. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't speak any English at that point. God, what a ridiculous film. But anyway, it's, a, it's, something, <laughs> it's something of a cult ca classic at this point. But <laughs> well, he's made good for himself. Yes, he has. He? Yes, he, he has. has. Well, speaking of our students, uh, yeah. if, let's turn to the studio audience Great. here and, and see if we can take some questions from our students. Yeah, I'd love to. Who would like to ask a question for Sarah Stein? Yes, sir. Um, my name is Alex Plank. Hi. I'm a student at George Mason University in the Film and Video Studies program. And I was wondering if you could describe the difference between the relationships of the producer, editor, and director in the documentary world versus the feature film world. That's a great question because they really are very separate um, entities in terms of the producer, director. In documentary, very often the producer is the director and vice versa because there isn't the funding. You know, you, you're often making the, the kind of documentaries I worked on, which are independent films, even though we, they, we would do them for public television and I worked with CBS, etc. Um, you know, nothing like the feature budgets that you have. So the producer very often was the person who got a grant from National Endowment of the Humanities or from public television and she or he would be the director as well. So my relationship as the editor um, was very much in documentary, you become sort of the script writer at the same time. There is no script, right? There's no narrator. So the film tells itself in the kinds of films that I did. And um, you really are sitting there, in a way it's writing. You're, you're structuring what the film is. And when you finish editing it, that's the film that was shot. But you know, it has no, it doesn't look like what it came out of the camera. I mean, I would work on films that had anywhere from 25 to 50 to 1 ratio. That means for every shot there could be 25 to 50 choices. Um, in, in feature film, just to finish that question, the producer um, is a very much a separate category from the director. A director is a specific artistic um, job and the producer both packages the film, deals with the money issues, makes sure it all comes in on time, etc. So it's a different relationship that way. And the editor is working with the script. They're, they're equally creative, but they're creative in a different way. They're, they're taking something that's a given. Um, I could start with something that was thought of as the end of the film as the beginning. You can't really do that in features. <laughs> be a little strange. I was actually going to be a doctor, you know, when I first started out, and <laughs> I'd always, right? I, yeah, I'd always liked the idea of being a surgeon, and and I discovered I had this strange ability to do this thing called film editing, which is very arcane and and odd, and I had no idea I could do that and, and was very good at it, but I've often thought that it's probably just as well I wasn't a surgeon. You know, I could see myself in there like, oh, well, what happens if you connect the aorta to the vena cava? <laughs> 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 or let's try this. I mean, not a good idea, but a very good idea in film editing, so anyway. And yet they both involve sharp objects. <laughs> That's right. You're, you're cutting all the time, there, yeah. right, but it's better that you're not, you know. That's great. Do we have another question from the, from the floor? Yeah, sir. Hi, my name is Brian Williams. Hi, Brian. I'm a film and visual studies major. I'm a senior here at George Mason. Um, my question is, do you think that filmmakers should aspire to um, win Emmys or Academy <laughs> Awards? Do you think that's what they should do, or should they be motivated by um, something else? I have no idea how you could be motivated. I mean, I, I have no idea what you would do to to win an Academy Award or Emmy. I mean, whatever that process is, it would escape me, even though the films I've cut have won all of those things. You, it's, it's just simply out of your control. I mean, you're, you're working on something and you're putting in the absolute best that you can. Um, and sometimes that best is not enough to take a mediocre film to a great height, right? I was fortunate with a piece like Bolero, another film I cut won the Academy Award actually on the same night <laughs> wow. on, on Princeton. I have a story to tell you about that, if you will allow me to. Please do. Um, but those two films won the same night. Uh, that one won the best documentary short. And the footage was great. And what I brought to it and was able to bring to it was able to extrapolate from all the footage that was shot and make something that people deemed worthy of an award. But, you know, that... You're not aiming for that, because what are you aiming for? It's just complete vapor, <laughs> you know. It doesn't mean anything. The story I wanted to tell you, especially as students, um, about the Academy Awards, I was 25 the night of the Academy Awards. The two films that won, Bolero and Princeton, um, had both been cut the year before. I mean, so I had moved on, right? I was a freelance. Um, and the night they both won, 
I had just finished a film. Since I was a freelance living in Manhattan in my fifth floor walk up with the bathtub in the kitchen, $65 a month rent, which is how I pulled this off, um, I was out of work because I was a freelance. I just finished film. The guy I'd been with for seven years and I had just broken up, so I was depressed, right? So, you know, then these two Academy Awards come and Everybody said, well, you just must be, you know, flying on top of the world. Well, no, actually, I was out of work. I had just been broken up with my boyfriend, and I was upset. <laughs> so it taught me a very valuable lesson, really valuable, that I can truly say has stayed with me throughout my life, which is what looks like it's going to be the source of happiness very often isn't. And don't put a lot of stock in it. You know, if somebody says to you, this is the way to success and that will bring you happiness in a certain way, you got to check it out very, very carefully. I mean, there's a reason why the guy making, you know, $5 billion in the stock market is doing cocaine at night and going down the tubes. You know, there's something off in that life very often. So it taught me very young that um, that flash and glamour doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to end up in the place that you want to. It did, however, do great things for my career. <laughs> so it launched me that way. <laughs> did, did you manage to have any fun on uh, Academy Award night is the real question. Uh, no, I was deeply depressed. Yeah. And <laughs> no, I, it, was, it was an amazing thing, yeah. but yeah. I wasn't in Hollywood, I was in New York, yeah. The, the, um, the awards for documentaries don't go to the separate categories. Mm -hmm. You probably all know that. You know, the Academy Award is given to the producer for the documentary. It's only in the feature um, category that you have uh, different uh, awards for editing and sound and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> You've related a, a very personal story which falls into the category of almost a, a life lesson yeah. uh, learned from your film experience. Are there other lessons that you've learned either either personally or professionally from your, your long experience of making substantive documentary yeah. films? Yeah, I mean, in a way, again, Bolero, some, perhaps because it was the first major film that I did, and um, I didn't even know what I could do yet. You know, that's how you move the head in these mm -hmm. areas. And I learned um, an extraordinary thing, again, that sounds sort of axiomatic and, and simplistic, but was, was in fact very real, which is that there's always a solution. Uh, when you're in the midst of something that you cannot, you know, sort of uh, solve, you can believe that there isn't a solution, and that's not true. Sometimes the solution is to throw something out, and that can be very hard to do. If you've worked on a scene for weeks and weeks and weeks and have to look at the film, which you do, by the way, you have to watch a film always from the beginning to the end. People tend to look just at the thing they're working on. It's not a good idea because it, it, people don't, the viewers don't see it that way. And um, in the beginning of Bolero, which is the backstage, the first half of that film, we cut it six different ways. I'm telling you, six different cuts. And you know, we're pulling our hair out at that point because it was boring. It was lousy. Everybody had been asked, um, why do you want to play a, a musical instrument? Everybody had been asked, what's it like to perform bolero? And, uh, you know, in, it was deadly, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> and we couldn't figure out what to do. So here was what I learned. And this was one of those moments, you know, in a lot's intuition and inspiration. I had this idea, let's forget all the structures and all the formulas that we had come up with and let's just take the things that we like best, the absolute best footage, and string it together in whatever order, basically almost random, like taking a pack of cards, throw them up in the air and let them fall and That's see great. what we got. And out of that came the final cut and it was right there and it taught me you have to let in art and any art form you have to let the material talk to you you know if you come in with a pre sort of formulated idea about oh it's going to be this then you you stifle it you 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 squeeze the life out of it and which did, is what we were doing with that footage of these wonderful musicians did you have to sell the director on that on that idea or did it sort of no drop we, it in was a, there mm -hmm. it was right there i mean you you know right away when yeah. you see something that's right and good it's 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 you know the doors open and the curtains go up and the light get you know, on the blue sky and all that it really is like that you know it's just like the breakthrough moment but that taught me a lot that there's always a solution and that sometimes it's abandoning whatever you think you're supposed to be doing with something. That thing about letting, being engaged and in communion in a way with the material, whatever the medium is, is a very, very important thing. And I teach my students that a lot. 
you really immerse yourself. I worked on a film that had 50 hours of film for a one hour film. There were five students graduating from high school and they had four to six hours of interview time each on film plus all these other activities. I ended up with six minutes six minutes of interview time for each one. You know, what were those going to be? I watched that film for two months without mm. making one single cut. I never cut anything. All we did was take out, all right, put that in first outs, put that in second outs, put that in selects. Editing begins not at the point that you make the splice. It, it begins at the point that you see the footage. That's the beginning because you're already associating ideas. But, but I had to immerse myself in the material and let the material start talking back to me. It's a pretty neat process. That's why people love it. Did any one of your films affect the audience in, in exactly the way you envisioned, more so than any others? Or do you, do you even think about audience impact as you're assembling the footage? I guess you do in the sense that you're trying to be true to the footage and be very aware of what works in film. I think the film, two films come to mind when you ask about impact. One was the film on the making of Einstein on the Beach, which is this very avant-garde um, opera. That's that the Philip Glass, the uh, Philip Glass uh, if Robert you know Wilson that, composer opera. Robert Wilson. And it ran four and a half hours. And it would have scenes that were 45 minutes of the same motion back and forth. When I saw it live before the film, I wanted to kill myself or them. I wasn't, I was whoever, somebody should die and let me out. I mean, it was a brutal experience. And I wish after having cut the film that I could have seen the opera again because then I understood it. But that had, I, I don't know, something that I did created this almost hypnotic underwater feel. It's very beautiful and people reacted that way. Beautiful. And the other one was Born Again. Born Again was a film on a Baptist church, very conservative and not of my persuasion and it was a very tough thing to be very true to those people and the footage mm -hmm. and we, we, the producer and I had a pact that we would have the members of the church and people like ourselves sit in a room and watch that film and both parties would say that's a fair portrait and we did it. That's terrific. But given how manipulative film can be, editing can be particularly, you can juxtapose things and say, well, that's really what happened, but in fact it can have a very powerful effect. And you have to have ethics, you know, you have to be true to things. Let's see if our students have any more questions. <laughs> yeah. Hello, my name is Arik, Hi. and I am a uh, fourth year film and video studies student. And I was wondering that with the influx of somewhat inexpensive video equipment on the market, what do you think about the fate of film as a medium? Well, um, they haven't been able to get the film look yet. I mean, it's, it's going that way. Film has a latitude, you probably know that. Um, if we were filming in here, if they're shooting digital, if they were filming with film in here, you would see in the shadows. And in digital, it still drops off. There's still very much more of a lit, and the, the shadow area still tends to be pretty opaque. Um, that film look is what we all grew up with, so we all see reality as that, right? You look at a film, you say, that's what reality looks like. Well, it's actually what film reality looks <laughs> yeah. like, but it's pretty convincing. <laughs> but um, digital isn't quite there yet, but it's getting, it's getting closer. Um, I think there'll be a point where when it can really, when you really can't tell, if you're looking at a film, if you're looking at digital, then it'll go digital because the expense, you know, is is there. But honestly, you can tell. And um, it's there's nothing as beautiful as film still. I teach students 16 millimeter negative. I mean, they want to shoot. We have Aries. They want to shoot film because they've learned digital, and it's great. It costs them a fortune. I mean, you know, I keep saying, do you really want to do this? But it's beautiful. I mean, it's a, it's a different thing. I do want to say I think it's a fabulous time, though, to be students in all of this because the whole thing that's happening with YouTube and, you know, all of that Internet access, I tell my students, look, make films and put them up there. You know, the, the thing about the film business and television and everything is very difficult. It's a very competitive world, very hard to break into. On the other hand, they're looking for material 24 hours a day. You know, somebody's got to supply it. So the truth is, is that producers are trolling YouTube and all of those internet sites. I mean, you can, there are situations where people will put something up there and somebody's going to see it. You all get, right, somebody's going to send, like the same film is going to be sent around and around. 
that's the thing that catches notice that way. So, and, and beyond whether you get a job out of it or not, I think it's a terrific thing that you get to make films and be creative. I mean, one of the things I really, if we have any time left, I want to say to you all, and, and really for the people watching, is that the thing that I learned is I didn't see myself as a creative person. And, and if somebody had said to me, you are a creative person, you should go into film, I never would have done it. I mean, it was only this accident of fate in a way. And I, I did have this extraordinary ability to do this arcane thing. But, but I think everybody has that creative part. And I think it's too bad that that doesn't get explored enough. And it doesn't have to be that you're going to make your living that way. It enriches your life. You know, there's more to life than your job, right? I hope we know that. And, uh, so I think this whole internet you know, phenomenon is great because you get to put stuff out and have a community and people share it and respond and you know, do it. I, I really urge people to. Let's go to our last student questionnaire. Sorry. I think we just have time for one more okay, question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Chris Gatewood. I'm a second year film student here at George Mason. And we've heard a whole lot of you, your statements about editing and how much you enjoy it, but if you hadn't decided to go into filmmaking, where do you think you would be right now? Hmm. That's a great last question, <laughs> in 30 seconds or less. I like dolphins a lot. I always thought, <laughs> <laughs> do you? I don't know. I think an oceanologist, but um, an oceanographer. But um, you don't know where life is going to take you. I didn't think I'd be an academic, Chris. So, you know, I'm an academic because I, I burnt out. You know, you tend to after 25 years. So. I, I, you know, I, I can't even entirely say where, where that would be. And, and um, I'm going to be 60 next year, and I'm thinking that uh, I probably need to start thinking about a new career. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll check in with you and see if you have any ideas. You can come back to the, to the next season of Studio A okay. and, and give us your new answers. <laughs> Sarah, thank you so much Thanks. for this sharing your time fun. and insights and expertise with us and wonderful things for students to hear and, and really for everybody to hear about the, the art and craft of filmmaking. Well, thank you so much. And this is a lovely series. Thank Terrific. you for having me on it. Thanks for being our first guest. Okay. I'm Rick Davis, and this is Studio A. Thanks for watching.